Hey folks, it's Michael here with the CCERP podcast, Cypress Creek Ecological Restoration Project. So, today we're going to have an interview with Jim Fordyce at the University of Tennessee, talking about ecology and things like that. It's a basic thing, we need to get down, you know, ecological restoration project, well what the heck is ecology and why is it important? And then in the future, we can talk about other detailed things, but um, being a teacher and having a degree in philosophy, um, I like to set the context first and things like that and get all ordered. So that's the way it's going to be. Now, I'm a little, maybe a little brain dead working at, I don't know, 70 or 90 percent since my sleep wasn't too good last night. I kept waking up for some reason. So if I'm a little stupid or if I miss some good questions, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it'll be better in the future, but Jim will take care of it. But, uh, so, um, we'll go ahead and without further ado, um, hey Jim, how's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being on. Much, much appreciated. Um, so can you tell the folks about yourself and what you do and your background? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm originally from Detroit area of Michigan, Dearborn, Michigan, and, um, I, uh, did my undergrad in biology at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, the home of Gibson guitar. <laughs> uh, and then I and I and and I I quite enjoyed you know biology in general, and so I stuck around and I did a master's um, at Western Michigan, and then did a little bit of teaching in the Kalamazoo area as well as you know worked some odd jobs. And in about 19, I guess, 97, I decided to go on and, and get a Ph.D. because, you know, why not stay in school if you're enjoying it, right? <laughs> so I, uh, I went out to University of California, Davis, and um, did a Ph.D. out there, um, primarily studying how insect behavior might modify plant chemistry by manipulating, um, by directly manipulating the chemistry of the plant through their behaviors and feeding on particular parts of the plant would actually make the plant better for, for the caterpillars to feed on. And so that's largely what my, um, what my work out there was about. And then I, uh, as soon upon graduation, I've been in Knoxville, Tennessee since then, um, primarily working on plant insect interactions and community ecology and, um, a little bit of, uh, I guess, population genetics, differentiation of different populations and the factors that, that drive that. Um, and I primarily actually teach now nothing but statistics courses because huh. wow. ecology and evolution is a very quantitative field. In fact, most of the common tools that people use um, in statistics were actually invented by one of the important characters in the modern synthesis of evolutionary thought. So there's a long history of stats as it were in ecology and evolution and I've that's what I've been ending up teaching now primarily. Oh, wow. Who's that person? Um um R. A. Fisher. Okay, I thought so. That's, that's what I was gonna guess. I wasn't sure, but yeah, yeah, I know about that. I yeah. learned that afterwards. I know I got a degree in math, did a course on um basic stat theory before I ever knew any stats. So I got it kind of backwards the way I did things, but um yeah, I remember Fisher coming up and then learning later that um, he was a biologist. <laughs> I was like, yeah. wow, pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. And then, you know, there's lots of fun things with stats. That's why stats is so fun. Like the T distribution was derived by a guy that worked for Guinness Beer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember it's, that. Yeah. That's one thing I learned that was interesting, too. I wish I would come up in the course, make it more interesting. Yeah. Instead of like. Because, you know, I mean, you know how it is with, like, math in particular and the math people. It's all, like, theory, theory, theory. Um, right. And it can come across as really dry. But it's actually quite fun if you if you can get over the initial intimidation. You know, yeah. I was, I was intimidated just like everybody else was <laughs> when I first started thinking about, you know, math and statistics. But it's such a huge part of, you know, the day-to-day -day operations of doing the science that I just kind of gradually became more and more comfortable with it. Hmm. And yeah. I was... I was convinced by a number of people to just start. <laughs> the class, so. so that's what I do now. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, often, least... often throws people off because they'll know that I'm, I'm an ecologist and I'm in the department of ecology. And then they'll ask me, so what do you teach? And I say, <laughs> and they're like, well, that doesn't make sense. 
<laughs> but I try to convince them that it does. It actually does make sense. Yeah. <laughs> Variation, averages, populations. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But, um, yeah, and actually, I think one of the best articles I've read about some theory of statistics and the philosophy of it is by, oh, dang, um, Stephen Gould. The median is not the message of that favorite art, um, famous article. Yeah, that sounds familiar. Definitely. He talked a lot about that. Used a lot of baseball metaphors and stuff huh. like that. Yeah, I got to read his books more. I haven't read them enough, but um, maybe I'll post that in the show notes if I recall. But really good article. Um, but did you do much? Like, were you outdoors a lot when you were growing up? Yeah. Even though I grew up in a pretty urban area, there was a, what I thought was a forest. But in retrospect, it was... <laughs> It was a, it was a, it was an old field with pretty mature trees, probably hundred year old trees. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I was always, I was always running around through the alleys of our urban area. There was a lot of toads there, so I used to love catching toads. That was probably hmm. the first organism that I became fascinated with. Um, and then insects, I absolutely loved. And then girls came along and kind of playing with them and looking at them and, huh. and stuff like that. So I've always been um, really, really interested in in being outdoors. Um, when I was a really young kid, I was, I guess I was in second grade, my parents put me on an airplane and I flew to uh, North Carolina to go to Ranger Rick Camp, which was <laughs> done by the National Wildlife Federation at that time. Um, and so, yeah, I've always been really interested in, in the outdoors and basically how organisms kind of do their thing and enjoyed, you know, observing it or feeling like I was part of it. So that was always an important thing for me. Oh, I didn't know like Rager Rick was actually a thing. When I was in Boy Scouts as a kid, I know some people would use the term, but of course, being a little punk kid and being stupid at the time, I wouldn't really look into things. I didn't know much, but um, so is the Ranger Rick thing still going on or is that? No, it's, uh, I think that it's now being done somewhere in Colorado, but that was the last I had heard. It's. I think it's officially called National Wildlife Federation Camp, but we all knew it as Ranger Rick Camp. Oh, okay, I was, okay. When yeah, I was wondering if it was... You hear about like... it from Ranger Rick Magazine, so, <laughs> so that's where, you know, that was your exposure to it. Which magazine? Um, Ranger Rick. Oh, huh. The kids' version of National Wildlife Magazine, so oh. it's, it's an educational kind of little magazine for kids. It was pretty cool for me as a kid. I remember getting those and looking forward to getting them every... You know, every month you get a new issue, and there's lots of cool pictures and little pieces of trivia. And you know, as a as a seven year old, you actually looked at it as like, wow, I'm learning all this cool information every month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. How long was camp? It was two weeks. What'd two weeks do? in the Blue Ridge Mountains, just pretty close to Asheville, North Carolina. Hmm. So yeah, so it's interesting. Now I'm back here, and this is now where I, <laughs> yeah. where I live. cool. <laughs> In the, the in the mountains, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Did they be a camp in tents in Ranger Rick Camp or? Uh, it was good old fashioned cabin camping, you know, okay. with yeah. bunk beds and stuff like that. But it was it was definitely a really good time. What kind of things did you do and learn? Um, you know, there would be. It was actually kind of interesting how it was set up because you would pick electives, and so, you know, there were things ranging from, you know, insect just basically insect biology or herpetology. There was even things on like photography and writing, you know, mm -hmm. like poetry and stuff like that. So it was all kind of a very integrated kind of thing. It was, it was a really cool, it was a really cool experience. Mm -hmm. um, I actually found out at a scientific meeting I went to maybe 10 years ago that um, a colleague of mine who was a professor at Mississippi State University um, he and I were actually at camp together. Wow. Huh. Yeah. That's so cool. There's a, there's a picture of all the <laughs> side of the hill and he's like, Hey, that's me. And I'm like, <laughs> and I was, I was sitting right next to him. So it was, wow. Pretty, it was <laughs> pretty even closer. Funny. Funny. This weird, this small world thing. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Yeah. But no, it was a, it was a, it was a fun experience. It was pretty, it was pretty, pretty darn cool. Definitely. But yeah. Photography. That's something that some people might not think is actually important. Um, just like, uh, if people do the iNaturalist thing, I do that. Take a lot of photos, post them on there. I've got a major backlog. Um, I must have like, I don't know, 
100, 200 observations I still got to get on there. Yeah. <laughs> but it drives you crazy. I've got like, um, on my iPhone, I've got like 19,000 pictures, and most of them are just nature stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, like, where's uh, the family picture again? Where's my friend again? That stuff is, is, pretty, is pretty cool, though. I think that, um, I think it's actually going to be, as, as more and more people do it and that database gets larger and larger, I think it's going to become more and more like actually super useful yeah. um, for, for scientists, just having that much, you know, data where you have, you've observed something occurring. It, it seems like it's a really kind of minor thing. And it's like, you know, nothing's really going to become of it, but I suspect that that's going to be really important data as, as we get more and more people, uploading things. I know that for some projects I've done out West, we have, you know, iNaturalist, um, hmm. kind of, we're, we're using that, that, that platform essentially for the purpose of citizen science. And it's actually quite helpful because somebody will take a picture of a particular insect and you'll know where it was taken and you'll be like, Oh, that's cool. We did not know that that was in that location. Oh, type yeah. thing. You know? yeah. So it actually, it's, it's a pretty neat thing. So yeah, if some people get out there um, and do that, they might actually find something that is rare or people don't know about. Um, there's still stuff to discover in this world. Um, it's good to document your own things, but and the help. more you do, the more you learn, and the more you learn about something, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the more you want to learn about yeah. about that thing. Yeah, you know, would you? You know, as I'm sure you know, you said that you've, you know, started learning the plants and stuff like that in the area where you're around. It's like once you once you can recognize the plants, the forest looks entirely different. Oh, yeah. Because mm -hmm. Before you do that, everything just looks kind of <laughs> yeah. like birds. You know, it's like until you know your birds, you know, maybe in your head you can imagine like 10 different things. You know, there's a there's a blue jay, there's a robin, there's a duck. But once you actually get to know the names of all the birds, suddenly the forest, you know, it looks a lot different. Everything looks different the more you know about it. And True. So I, I think that things like, you know, encouraging people to just take pictures of things and send them in, you know, iNaturalist and have them be identified and stuff. It's just a really cool thing because it's a way to edu educate yourself on on what's out there. And, and again, you know, the world looks a lot different the more you can kind of see, you know, the different players as opposed to it just being – that's outside nature and that's it. Yeah. Once you see all the different pieces, you I think it's, it's kind of a nice way to kind of appreciate what's going on and how complex it really is. Yeah. And I recommend that for people. I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause it happened to me at first. It was like, it's just a bunch of green stuff and a bunch of green leaves. And now it's like when people get more familiar with it, you get more involved. Um, and it's like, it becomes like home and family and friends. It's like you keep, you see some tree and then you, every time you pass it, you see it again. Then you start wondering how it's doing and how healthy it is and stuff like that. And, um, Absolutely. you see the interactions and it's like, you know, you want something complex. It's like, I have a degree in math. It's like, as I tell people, calculus is easy. <laughs> you want something complicated, do biology. That's complex. <laughs> Math doesn't adapt. Quadratic equations stay quadratic equations. They don't adapt to anything. Yeah, yeah, and and you can actually understand things in math. And that's a that's a joke with you know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of people. There's a whole there's a whole group of you know, or section of ecology which is math essentially. It's yeah. you know mathematical theory and it's theoretical expectations and stuff. And when I took a mathematical modeling class when I was in grad school, the, the joke that the professor said was you know the mathematician will always look for his keys under the spotlight in the, uh, in, in the parking lot, even though he knows he lost the keys in the bushes because under the spotlight, he can see what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's like the whole idea of like the math is complicated, but it's a simplification of the natural world, which still is a challenge for yeah. all of us today. It's, yeah. it's a lot more complicated than people would think. And then if people get out there, um, Dang, I forgot what that creature is. Oh, um, it's not coming to me, but something like a newt out here, um, lizard kind of thing. Stupid. I can't think of it. Um, but actually, one time I was out on the trail, and I came across um, two of them mating and made a video 
and I took some pictures and put it on my naturalist and someone said that that was actually interesting because they because they're out, outdoors um, and they're not seen as much um, their mating behavior isn't known as much they don't know as much mm -hmm. about it and you know here I just thought I was taking this little video and if I would have known it was like a less a big deal <laughs> then I would have taken a longer video but yeah. I mean, here I'm just like me, a little like nobody, and, you know, other people can do the same thing. Come across something that isn't as well known or people want to know more about or is rare. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it could be something, a new discovery or exploration for people in general and not just us. But it's one thing we got to look at is not just... Well, everyone already knows that. Why should I do it? Well, what about you? All right. It's like, yep. Discover things and, on your own. Yeah. And it's, you know, we, we, we certainly don't know nearly as much as people think we do. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot, there's, there's a lot more mystery out there than I think a lot of people appreciate. And I think that's true in, you know, most fields is, mm -hmm. you know, we have kind of a view that, oh, yeah, people have that all worked out. And in reality, we really don't. Yeah. Um, we're still, like, in the baby steps of trying to learn how really, especially really complex systems are operating. Mm -hmm. And those complex systems are complex because there's a lot of moving parts. And so an important step is to kind of, you know, at least understand the important moving parts in, yeah. in the system, to kind of understand how it, how it operates. And that's a good segue to another question about what is ecology, but complexity in ecology. But before we do that, um, let me say, like, did you did you get interested in nature and stuff on your own when you were a kid or like, did you learn from your parents or what? Um, I think my parents always <laughs> encouraged it. Um, you know, I, I don't I, I just think I always just just had this kind of curiosity about the natural world as far back as, as I can remember being, being very young. I, um, I was always interested in, you know, catching critters and looking at the critters and letting them go. And then, you know, being interested in just kind of animals in general. So my parents certainly encouraged me to do that. My dad was a veterinarian, so he <laughs> knew a little bit about animals, obviously, but I wasn't interested in cows and horses. I was interested in <laughs> the weird, in the backyard um you know and so yeah i was always super fascinated with with the natural world and somewhat amusingly you know like now professionally i i do this my mom um just gets a kick out of it she thinks it's really funny that you know, <laughs> like i can't believe you actually are getting paid to do what you were doing when you were four <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah huh. so but but yeah no i've always that's just always been always been uh, an important part of my life you know even growing up in an urban area I would I could find lots of interesting organisms just in the hedgerow by by the house you know and and see really cool things and and that's despite the fact that I'm a total arachnophobe I still am to this day <laughs> terrified of spiders like my oh. adrenaline goes up <laughs> and, you know, and I can I can rationalize with myself. It's like if there's anybody in the world that you know shouldn't be an arachnophobe, it's probably somebody who <laughs> does yeah. you know, arthropods for a living. But yeah, there's just something about them. So even as a kid, it's like it totally creeped me out. But huh. I was always willing to go back in and crawl in because there might be other cool beetles or something, which huh. never bothered me at all. It was yeah. just eight-legged guys. But but yeah, no, for my whole life, it's just been a thing that I've been interested in. Cool. Yeah, I think. Um... I grew up, you know, in basically kind of the same time, and it was better off back then. I think we were like free range kids before free range kids was a thing. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so nowadays, like, if a parent is worried about letting their kids be free range, and I guess you could at least do it like um, under supervision, people should at least let the kids get out, enjoy nature, um, explore on their own, and learn and just maybe stay around to supervise them if you don't want to let them run around. But uh, right. and I think it's natural in us, just like E.O. Wilson has said with his bio, biophilia hypothesis. And I know Baron Heinrich I've talked to him a few times on a different podcast. Um, same idea that there's just something in us that it's in our nature to like the natural world. 
Yeah. I think, yeah. And, and I think it's important because, you know, in, in, you know, in my view, it seems like culturally we've been going for a long time with this kind of idea that we're separate from nature. So we're actually, we're observing some other play, not realizing that we're actually part of the play, that we are characters in the play. True. And so that's another reason why I think it's just really good for people to kind of just to go outside to kind of appreciate the fact that, you know, we are doing what we do and we build buildings and we build these huge infrastructures because that's what humans do. But <laughs> yeah. we're, we are still part of the, the natural world. It's, it's, I think erroneous to think that somehow we're separated from it and True. we're looking in on it. Amen. Um, yeah. Cause then we start, then we start thinking like, Oh yeah, well we can control these things and we can like actually, you know, kind of basically manage the natural world entirely for our own purposes. And I think that, well, I think we're discovering now that that's a little naive. And there's been a lot of times in, in mm -hmm. history where we've discovered the hard way that that is a very kind of naive view to think that we, we are not part of it because ultimately we are part of it. You know, emergent diseases, that's, that's the whole field of ecology there, disease hmm. ecology. Yeah. Huh. Where do they come from and stuff like that. So... I think that it's a. Uh, I think it's really important. For, Just like, you know. like Horace said, the ancient Latin writer, Roman writer, um, something like to paraphrase, he said, "You can throw nature out on a pitchfork, but yet she will find her way back." <laughs> <laughs> that seems that seems about right. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> Cool. So I guess that makes it even better. We were talking about complexity and how we're part of things, too. So um, what is ecology? Yeah, so ecology is a, it's a first of all, I'll say it's a big field um, and it tends to encompass a lot of different things. My my favorite definition of ecology is actually the definition that is used in one of the kind of classic textbooks in ecology that was written by Began and Townsend and Harper. And they define ecology as the scientific study of the distribution and abundance of organisms and the biotic and abiotic factors that determine distribution and abundance. Hmm. And that, and that's, it, that sounds kind of dry and boring, <laughs> but it, it, I think that that encompasses exactly what, um, ecology is trying to do it's basically trying to figure out why does everything seem to have a place or simply um you know i guess i i also, I also consider evolutionary biology to be a component of ecology because hmm. that is where evolution is occurring is hmm. in you know yeah. the thing in the world and you know the, you know i think that the question is is like you know we have all this great diversity why isn't there just one organism on the planet that does everything why do we have more than one species on the planet? And so, you know, that is in part, you know, what ecologists are trying to understand. Like, why do we, why do we see certain organisms here and not there? And now it, for a lot of us, you know, or for a lot of things, it, it's pretty obvious, you know, it's like, oh, you find cactuses in the desert because cactuses are adapted to dry, arid, warm climates. And you don't expect to see, you know, other things, and you don't you don't expect to see a, a cactus, you know, in the tundra, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in you know really easy for us to think about now. But even you know 150 years ago, it was really unclear. Like you know, what were the constraints? Why can't why can't hmm. we do this? And so interesting. So yeah, so ecology. You know, I think that the the, the roots of ecology were probably in population modeling, um, going you know back hmm. to the the 1800s or even late 70s, now early 1800s with Malthus, where he just basically showed that something has to constrain population growth because if it doesn't, you'll get exponential growth and, you know, the whole world will be covered by one particular species if you didn't, if, if there's nothing to kind of prevent that. And then that's where you start to think about, well, you know, is it other organisms that are keeping it from, you know, becoming an exponential kind of growth mess? Or is it limiting resources? And if it is limiting resources, what are those resources? And what are the important resources for one group of organisms and, and another? And then when you start talking about, so that's, that's kind of what population ecology is. And then when you think about a bunch of interacting populations, that usually falls underneath what we refer to as community ecology. Hmm. 
So that's just organisms that are interacting at the same place and time, um, you know, in some kind of defined defined area. And, you know, what determines, you know, diversity? Like, or is it dominated by one plant or one animal? Or is it, you know, kind of evenly distributed among a bunch of different plants and different animals? And those are all things, you know, again, thinking about distribution and abundance, thinking about interactions that determine that, um, as well as as well as resource availability, and so then you can get to really large ecological type things, which are which falls underneath what we refer to as ecosystem ecology, and ecosystem ecology is really about how um, the biotic and the abiotic components of the planet interact. So, mm -hmm. for an ecosystem ecologist, you're interested in like you know where is all the carbon at any given time? Is it, you know, in the biomass? Is it in, in, is it being stored in the soil? Is it being released into the atmosphere? How does that, you know, affect, you know, other parts of, of the whole system? How does it maybe affect, you know, how nitrogen is being moved around the system? So it's very much, very kind of writ large ecosystem ecology is is really thinking about how life actually affects all the abiotic components of of the environment, hmm. and so you know, and so that and that's again that that's very different than somebody who just studies the population ecology. Hmm. Oh, and that's yeah. by ecology being really big because it does encompass so many things. But but I'll stand by the definition that I think overall ecology is simply the study of distribution and abundance why are things where they are and what do they do when they get there mm -hmm. <laughs> why can't we leave, so. and then just um in case some folks didn't catch it you talked about biotic and abiotic so what the hell's biotic and what the heck is sorry i didn't mean to say what the hell i just slipped i'm, I'm tired no, no, i meant to say what the heck what the heck is the biotic and abiotic <laughs> you're making me look good in case my mom <laughs> yeah um, yeah, so when we talk about biotic interactions, we're talking about when organisms interact. So, you know, a hawk eating a rabbit, that's a biotic interaction. Mm -hmm. It's also a biotic interaction if you're the rabbit eating the plant. Um, plants competing for a resource or animals competing for a resource would be an example of a biotic interaction. Um, and usually, oftentimes, it's those biotic interactions, um, especially competitive interactions, that determine how big a population can get you know if there's only so much food for so many rabbits that's going to limit how big the population of rabbits can get because they'll start to run out of food and they'll they'll obtain what's referred to as the carrying capacity for an area which is the number of rabbits that can live in that area given the amount of resources so all in diseases you know predation all those kinds of things would be things that would fall underneath biotic interactions and then abiotic things are those interactions with the environment that are not living parts of the environment. So, you know, here in Knoxville two days ago, we dropped down well below freezing, which is entirely uncharacteristic <laughs> time of the year. And as a consequence, there was, I saw on the, on the walk home, I saw, I think, five dead squirrels. Huh, wow. That, that were run over, but they were run over in a parking lot. Like, you know, you, if you see a squirrel run over, usually it's a car going 55 miles an hour. It's not somebody backing out. But they were they were shivering. And so that clearly hmm. that killed a lot of squirrels. Huh. Um, that would be an example of an abiotic interaction, um, a flood, you know, or any kind of kind of chemistry, really. You know, if if you have, you know, an area that's salty, this is why, you know, you have plants that live in salt marshes, but they can't live in fresh water. So the presence of the salt in the water would be an example of uh, abiotic um, factor that's determining distribution and abundance. And so with that definition, you're always, you know, kind of keeping keeping the eye, keeping your eye on both balls that are happening at the same time, which is, which is, you know, what, are, how are the organisms interacting and how is that determining things? And then how is, you know, those organisms, how are those organisms interacting with the abiotic um, or non-living components of the system? Um, you know, the giant asteroid at the KT boundary that took out the dinosaurs, that would be an example of a very dramatic abiotic um, effect of something, hmm. right? Or yeah. an abiotic factor that affected populations. So, yeah. So, yeah, I guess another one would be 
um, the biological influencing the non-biological influencing the biology, biological, like when the Romans salted the fields of the, ooh, dang, who was it? It slipped my mind. Um, I just almost had it when they were fighting, the Carthaginians. Yeah, they, they defeated the Carthaginians and salted the fields and then nothing could grow, wiped out everything. Yeah, well, and you, you have kind of, which are actually very interesting places to study, but it, at least out west, there are a lot of places where there historically were mines. And so you have these large areas where you have mine tailings, which are all the leftovers after you've extracted the stuff you want that you're mining out of the earth. There's all these leftovers that tend to be just covered in, you know, pretty bad, like heavy metals, like lead mm -hmm. and arsenic and stuff like that. And those areas, the vegetation associated with those areas are very, very different, obviously, mm, yeah. because of those abiotic, you know, conditions. But you still see vibrant, you know, plants that can deal with it. Mm. They're, they're very happy. And that would be an example of where the abiotic conditions are limiting mm. the, um, the movement. Or, 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 or where plants can, can establish themselves. I think um, we have a similar thing in the Davy Crockett National Forest, like northeast of here. Um, I think if, if I'm remembering the forest correctly, um, because of some mining, there's um, some trace minerals that are more abundant there. And so you might want to be careful about where you forage out there or which water you drink, some things like that. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, so those kind of abi but what's interesting is that there's also, you know, interesting things that organisms do to the abiotic environment that can have these cascading um, consequences. A lot of a lot of cave systems, um, hmm. obviously the water is eroding it, but a lot of cave systems are also created by bacteria hmm. that are are what are called chemolithoautotrophs. <laughs> It's, it's just basically a really big way of saying that they don't use sunlight and they don't feed on other bacteria. So they're using basically um, elements that are in the rock. Huh, and yeah. as a consequence of eating those ele or elements that are in the rock, they change the pH of the water, which then can cause the cave to effectively um, form at a faster rate because mm, the wow. water will be more acidic. And then a lot of times we don't really think about that, you know, organisms – have that effect on the abiotic environment, except of course humans, which can have a huge effect on the abiotic environment. And maybe, you know, I guess to a lesser extent, people appreciate that that beavers are good little ecosystem engineers and can have a profound effect on the on the abiotic environment. Well, at least um, they're starting to learn that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really. <laughs> but oh yeah, like one thing I've read in a geology book, um, some listen to on Audible. Um, history of the earth thing I forgot which one but yeah I talked about how the only reason we have gems is because life evolved and produced oxygen so a lot of gems would not exist without that yeah, absolutely. Well, I was weirdly over beers last night I was having <laughs> a conversation about, about the profound impact that um, photosynthetic bacteria had on the planet because that's the only reason why um, we have large iron ore deposits. Oh, wow. Before, before, before these bacteria came along, we had a very, we had a, a reducing um, atmosphere and planet. What do you and mean so by reducing? Our oceans were bright turquoise green because oh. they, were, they were saturated, not saturated, but there was just lots of iron in there. Hmm. And then along comes these um photosynthesizing bacteria that start creating this horrible waste product that was very toxic. <laughs> yeah. It was very toxic because it's very oxidative, very reactive. And so they start releasing oxygen. And then over the course of, you know, I don't know, I don't even know what it was, 100 million years or 500 million years, um, slowly all of the iron in the oceans precipitated out. Oh, wow. Settled hmm. to the bottom. And, wow. you know, it's a huge, profound impact on the whole planet, obviously, mm. you know you've totally changed the, the chemistry of the atmosphere of the planet. Wow. So, so, you organ, so we're not that, we're not all that special. Organisms have yeah. been changing the atmosphere of the planet for a long time. Can you remind <laughs> folks what reduction and oxidation are? Um, it just has to do with how um, reactive a, um, a, a particular compound is. And so 
whether or not, so for example, iron oxide is rust. Mm -hmm. And so that would be um, basically the oxygen is able to covalently bond with, with the iron. And um, yeah, so it just has to do with whether or not, um, let me think how to, like trying to trying to put this in an easy way. It basically has to do with whether or not you're really hungry for electrons or whether you're willing to give away electrons. And so if you're if you're hungry for electrons, you're gonna grab or you're gonna be a reducer. Um, and if you're if you're happy to give away electrons, then you will be you will be oxidized. And so give them away. And so it's just it's just a chemical term that describes um, whether or not things are willing to give away or or, or take um, electrons in, in basic chemistry. And folks can remember, you probably hear about oxidation stuff in the body. Um, yeah. Like, but you gotta, we got to remember that wherever there's an oxidation reaction, there's always a reduction reaction. You can't have one without the other. Right. So. Exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, like, that's why, you know, people are interested in that in the body and they're interested in scavenging what are called free radicals because yeah. radicals, um, you know, might might covalently bond with something you don't want them to bind with in, in the body. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, so if you're, if you've undergone oxidation, you've lost electrons. And if you, and if you, if you like to gain electrons, then you've undergone reduction. You have mm -hmm. been reduced. The easy way to remember that is that if you gain an electron, electrons are negative charges, and so your charge has been reduced. That's the way That's I remember it. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. And then, of course, oxidation is the opposite. You go up. But So, yeah, that shows, like, <laughs> coming back to one thing I said earlier, how calculus is easy, biology is hard. I mean, heck, ecology, physics, geology, chemistry – biology yeah. you know a physicist doesn't have to, to have to work with all that but an ecologist um all that stuff comes into play it's like very complicated complex yeah, but, a, lot, a lot of things to keep track of which is why people specialize on one little small thing <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but so let's see maybe let's um oh and one thing for folks the abiotic um in our area that would be flooding like when hurricane harvey came through um we had, you know, geez, it's like, depending on where you were around Houston and the coast, west of Houston, east, um, we had like 30 to 60 inches of rain in like three or four days. Um, just massive rainfall, um, massive flooding around here. Some places in the creek, it was like five or 10 feet underwater. Um, some places around Houston, I know I was I was kind of shocked and surprised that the water didn't subside in some areas to like literally like a month or two after the after the flood. Wow, it was amazing. Yep. But wow. um, not something we got to deal with there on the creek a lot the the flooding. Um, but um, so maybe we can make this a little concrete, like with ecology. Um, looking at the relationships between things. So um, let's say what might happen to our area if we got rid of all the snakes? How would that, so we have all these cascading effects, how would that affect um, the world we live in? Well, I would guess, again, this is just based upon my, I'm not a snake biologist. <laughs> Um, I, I, I think that the, the, the accepted paradigm and the experiment that has been played out before when people have eliminated predators, um, you know, snakes or, you know, whether they be mammal predators or whatever they are, is that the things that they are feeding on tend to start doing really, really well. And so you get rid of all the snakes, you're probably going to have lots more rats and mice. And if you really want a lot more rats and mice, then, you know, that that could be a strategy for doing that. You probably don't want a lot more rats and and mice um, for obvious reasons. First of all, nobody really likes rats. That <laughs> yeah. Um, but then, you know, they can also be important carriers of diseases, et cetera, et cetera. 
And, you know, that's what the snakes are doing. Snakes are just living out their lives, you know, eating the stuff that you are probably pretty happy that they're, that they're eating, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true, you know, with, with other predators as well. And, you know, now there's a, there's a, there's a strong appreciation for that compared to say in the 1950s yeah. where, you know, it was considered really good management practices to shoot hawks and eagles yeah. and eagles yeah. because that way you would have more game. And, you know, that's, that's a, that was a very naive view about the role that those predators are, are, are playing and, you know, an oversimplified view of, of how things are, are happening. So mm -hmm. a lot of those, unforeseen consequences of eliminating a predator um, for one reason or another. I, I, it, the, the example that I think is an amazing example is the, um, the sea otters off of the coast of um, the Pacific Northwest. You know, there was this idea that, oh, yeah, there's all these, you know, little predator mammals that are we're competing with for fish. And so they nearly drove those, that species to extinction. They pretty hmm. much eliminated them not appreciating the fact that the favorite food of those animals were sea urchins. Hmm. And if you eliminated all of the predators that were feeding on the sea urchins. Now the sea urchin population exploded and it started basically destroying all of the kelp forest and it successfully, you know, reduced the kelp forest greatly. And then all the fish left because there was no kelp forest. Huh, and so wow. it's an interesting story of an unintended cascading consequence that you think that you're removing a predator that you're competing with. And by removing that predator, the resource vanishes because there's no longer habitat for the fish. Um, and so that's why it's important to always kind of think carefully about, you know, what role is this particular organism playing in, in the environment? And oftentimes, you know, predators, you know, get a bad rap, whether they be larger predators that people think are eating their livestock or whether or not it just be something that people are creeped out by, like snakes, and not really appreciating, you know, what what exactly role that they are playing. And, you know, it just leads to a healthier system if you have all these kind of checks and balances, especially between, you know, the producers and the consumers and the predators which in ecology, we like to, we, 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 cause you know, it's science, right? So you have to <laughs> name for everything, but we refer to that as trophic levels. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the level of, you know, where you are feeding and where are you getting your energy from? Hmm. So, yeah. So things like, you know, things like snakes and, you know, other predators, coyotes or whatever they might be, um, are usually an indicator of at least, a a not too unhealthy system. I don't <laughs> want to say it's an indicator of a healthy system um, because they're very adaptable as well. Um, you know, you know, you can see coyotes in very urban areas. They're a very, they're a very adaptable animal. Um, but yeah, predators are, are a good thing to come, to have around. They're certainly keeping things in check that we probably like the idea of being held in check yeah. in the long run. We probably like that. And yeah, so there is an example of many of why ecology is important, um, something we need to know um, because of things like that. And I can give a few other examples for folks like uh, scribe vineyards in California. I don't remember what book I heard about this in, but so these people are out taking care of their vineyard. Some guy's riding around on his horse. Oh, look, a rattlesnake. I don't like snakes. Rattlesnakes are bad. <laughs> Kill it. Shoot it. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> Kill it. Shoot it. Shoot it. And then the guy finds, wait, why are my like grapes being eat up now? It's like, what's going on? Oh, the gophers are doing it. And right. instead of being like some people, oh, I got to poison the gophers now. The guy had better thinking skills. So he snapped. Oh, there's more gophers because I killed the rattlesnakes. And the rattlesnakes are one of the only things that can go into the den to get the gophers. Right. So I'm losing profits because I killed the snake. I, no. Yep. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there are people that actually, um, you know, both for like for snakes or for bats and stuff, they actually try to put kind of a monetary value on like how much is one really worth if you were to pay it to hmm. take care of your gophers and stuff. Yeah, so but, yeah, that, yeah. Those, can be, those can be, you know, important important things to consider. Definitely. Yeah, and um, then a lot of people know about the wolves of Yellowstone, how they change rivers. 
Um, if I remember, I can put up a think about that. People have seen a little clip about that, but if you look at a longer one, I think that whole thing got all started by a hydrologist studying rivers and wondering why the river was not behaving as they usually do. And they think, is it global warming? Is it this other thing? Then they find out, oh, it's like after the wolves were introduced, you I think it was then that they realized it was because the wolves weren't there. Right. Um, yep. Yeah, because the, they've ended up, wolves have ended up having a dramatic impact on the vegetation in Yellowstone because they've changed the foraging behavior of the, the large herbivores that mm -hmm. they, they feed on, especially yeah. like, you know, caribou and stuff like that. And then um, the, the, the Kaibab in Arizona around the Grand Canyon, I think there's another example where Roosevelt and others wanted, as you talked about earlier, they wanted the game oh let's kill off the predators so we can have more deer then they do that and then um because the bobcat mountain lion wolf coyote others have been killed the deer population explodes mm -hmm. and um then they start overgrazing, and then a lot of them starve to death yeah exactly and you know they're Deer are a really good example of what happens when you when you have a limited amount of a, of a top predator, and that's where it actually it becomes really important that they are managed because they can be incredibly destructive. They are you know they can totally change the vegetation huh. and have all these cascading consequences because they're generally not you know held in check I guess unless they're managed right hunting that's where hunting yeah. is actually really important because if you don't do that you could lose a lot of other things in the forest just because the deer will, will eat them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, we got some deer around here and it's nice. Um, it's good to see them. I think even, even though it's like in this suburban area, um, people might not think it, but I've even seen like at least six or eight point buck around here. It's awesome. Yeah, that's great. But yeah, um, then we got to watch them though, like, because around the roads, um, when deer are overpopulated, then there are a lot of car accidents. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> that definitely, <laughs> that definitely happens. Being from Michigan, that was a, that was a, that was a big one. Yeah, so. too bad. But, uh, yeah, so we need coyotes and bobcats in our area to, although what, they eat mostly mice, right? Rabbit. Um, what, which ones? Coyote and bobcat. Probably, or other small mammals, or even small snakes, I would <laughs> assume. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, certainly I would think that, you know, like squirrels would be a happy, a happy thing for them to eat, or... Mm -hmm rabbits or mice and rats and stuff like that and again coyotes are pretty opportunistic so yeah so yeah but if they do the control the deer at least a little bit i know one time a few decades ago i was out on a horse and it was fascinating out in some woods near a railroad bridge and i came across um a pack of i don't know three to five coyotes chasing a small deer that was wow. fascinating. Just, you know, they were just, they ignored me. You know, the deer was running for its life. The coyote were after the deer. You could see the fear in the deer's eye. Um, they just whoosh, went right by. Crazy. And they were just, I don't know, within like 10 yards or something like that. I don't remember how close, but they were close. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I've seen something similar to that once, but it was a pack of feral dogs. It wasn't coyotes. Hmm. You know, maybe I'm remembering wrong. This could have been like wild dogs, but given the area and all this stuff, I don't think so. I'm not sure. Uh, it was probably coyotes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That seems pretty reasonable. <laughs> yeah. But um, so there's some reasons why. Yeah, we got to take care of that. You know, snakes, um, hawks, owls, cuddy and bobcat. People might be kind of scared of them. I mean, yeah, it's like be scared of snakes, but at least. And like load them if you want, but at least appreciate them for what they do for our environment, make us healthy. 
and and learn a little something about them, and then you probably won't be as, you know, uncomfortable with them. I mean, I think a lot of it is just people don't know, you know, yeah. that much about them. They don't really appreciate that they're not going to harm you. It's like it's it's you have to try hard to get bit by a poison, by a venomous snake. Yeah, true. <laughs> you, they're not they're not out looking for you. They are trying to avoid you at all costs, basically. And then people can see that on some videos I've made around coral snakes or copperheads. Maybe I'll post some of that. Um, yeah, I was scared of them too. Um, but then being outdoors a lot, um, I've seen a snake and watched it from a distance. And then I learned that I can be a little closer. But because I'm like kind of slow and I don't trust myself to get too close, I'm not going to get too close. But I know right. I can be within a few feet and take a five-minute video of a copperhead. And it's not going to come after me. I'm not going to go after it everyone's all happy that's all we're all copacetic and then we yeah. go our own way but um people don't got, really got to worry about him as much but yeah it's kind of funny <laughs> i say exactly what you did is like the snakes have some other purpose in the world than going after you <laughs> yeah. right. they, they definitely have better things to do <laughs> just like you they want to live they want to lie in the sunshine and enjoy it and yeah they want to be left alone get a belly full of mice yeah <laughs> Yeah, but uh, and then when they do, they don't want to do anything because they're lethargic. So right, yep, yep, yeah. So I would say you know if you got predators hanging around, that's always a good sign. Cool. Um, and so yeah, and it's important on this. Like people get in their subdivision, get in their house, drive around to buildings, and then lose sight of the broader world we live in. Um, we need to keep in mind or we should keep in mind and learn what's really making it possible. Um, the broader nature around us, we depend on it. It doesn't depend on us. So knowing this ecology helps a lot. Um, and what would you say, like, I know someone who said that um, he didn't understand what ecology was, apparently, and he, th he thought that his backyard was his ecology. And, I mean, he's got a garden back there, and he grows some stuff, but... Um, some grapes and other things, but what are some of the mistakes he's making in thinking that his little backyard is his ecology? Um, I I would actually I, I I'm not convinced that he is making any any huh, mistakes. Interesting. With you, it's uh, you know, he, he, again, ecology is just factors that are determining distribution and abundance. So there there is a whole field <laughs> of ag agricultural ecology, for example. Um, like the actual ecology of agro systems, because again, you can think about what organisms are there, what's preventing them from maybe, maybe from being there, as well as what are the the biogeochemical cycles that happen in agricultural land. So that is as much of the ecology as a pristine part of the Amazon. Um, you know, you could you could study ecology in a toxic waste dump, and mm -hmm. a lot of people do that because <laughs> they're really interested in the organisms that can survive in these toxic waste dumps because maybe those organisms would be helpful for us to clean up areas that we would rather not have, you mm -hmm. know, toxic, toxic waste dumps. Um, you know, apropos to, to the area of the world where, where you live, um, you know, I have, I have some colleagues that, that basically study bacteria that eat oil. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And they go to, you know, drilling sites around the world in the ocean and they sample bacteria where there's seeps and spills into the ocean hmm. kind of to understand who are the bacteria that are able to eat oil. And, you know, everybody would like to have a magic, a magic bug that you could spray on an oil spill and have it, you know, turned into a less lethal form. And so I, I don't think that it's necessarily wrong to say that, you know, the yard is the ecology, but it's it's clearly it's a it's a managed system, and you know we are clever animals that can that can modify our environment a lot, but you know I mean people do that you know it, it, you know you can have you know it, it, a bird feeder for that matter is really you're providing a resource to the birds you are affecting their distribution and abundance. Um, whether bird feeders are a good or a bad idea is a topic for, for mm. somebody else to, to talk with you about. Mm. But, um, but yeah, I would say that I think that that's okay as long as you appreciate that, you know, it's, it's, it's a highly modified system. You don't know, you know, it's unlikely that if nobody kind of took care of that system constantly with an input 
that it would remain the way that it that it remains. But yeah, there's a whole there's a whole ecology that can happen in in your garden in the backyard. And I don't know if you've you know her recently they're encouraging people not to rake their leaves and they're encouraging people maybe not to mow their lawn as much and stuff like that cool. and that's just all about you know maximizing the potential for some diversity mm-hmm. to occur there and so a lot of things that you know ecologists study you know aren't aren't really those pristine beautiful beautiful areas i I've, I've been fortunate in that i often am <laughs> in pristine beautiful yeah. areas but I've also done quite a bit of work on, um, you know, agricultural systems in the Great Basin um, and looking at those agricultural systems as small oases for for native um, insects to thrive in an area where they might not otherwise be able to thrive because, you know, it's it's the middle of the stinking desert. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, agriculture is, has, has modified that. So... I think that it's not necessarily a wrong way to wrong way to think about it. Um, I mean, I suppose it could be the wrong way to think about it, depending on what you what you think ecology is. But there are ecological interactions that are happening pretty much anywhere that there's life, by definition. Yeah. Um, and with these managed systems, a lot of it breaks down to what what kind of what kind of an environment do we want to live in, surrounded by. Um, and what can maintain us. We can't have the mm-hmm. whole planet being paved over because, you know, we would start having cascading consequences that we probably wouldn't like. Yeah. Um, so. And I like your oasis idea. I think that's one thing I was trying to get to convey to him that, okay, it is his ecology to some extent, but you got to look at the bigger picture. It's an oasis in something. So where does your sunshine come from? It doesn't come from your backyard. Where does your right. water come from? It doesn't come from your backyard. How do you eliminate your waste? You know, your water and your waste don't stay there. Where do yep. you get your food? You go to a farmer's market and a grocery store. So, um, yep. and you got to consider the broader area that's affecting you. You know, that's, th- that's, so yeah, I guess that's the thing I was trying to convey to him a little more. Yeah. No, I but, think that, I think that's right. It's, it's wrong to think of any system as being a closed system. And I think that, that there's, I think that's widely accepted now in ecology that no systems are closed systems. Mm-hmm. Um, in the early days of ecology, there were actually lots of arguments about hmm. whether or not you should think of communities as a closed system. Like, no, I studied this lake as a closed system. And now we know that all the inputs from the land and stuff affect the, the lake or the river or whatever it might be, and that things can't really be thought of as a closed system. You can't study the, you know, the community of organisms that live in a river without appreciating that all of the surrounding area that is not part of that river is likely having a pretty profound influence on who is living in that river. And so that whole idea of a closed versus open system, I think, is an important, is an important thing, definitely. Cool. So yeah, that apply to everyone living along the creek. It's like we don't just have our house, or apartment, or subdivision, or apartment complex. It's important to look at it in the bigger picture because we influence it and it influences us. Um, just like get rid of all the snakes, then you're going to be having more mice come onto your property, and rats, yeah. and squirrels, yeah. and then some of that stuff will be, or maybe deer, and they're going to eat your garden and stuff will eat up your plants and trees and is that what we really want? Right. Exactly. But, yep. um, so yeah, so the ecological thinking is important. Learning about what ecology is, how to think about that, how to apply that to our world and do it slowly. Um, go out in nature and start observing some of the relationships and then think about how they apply to your lawn, your world. Yep. Um, your health. It's in your self-interest. I 100% would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, one, one thing I like, I like to say, talk about the, the leaves and, pardon, go ahead, what? I, I say, I think it's really important to, for people to go outside and at least appreciate what's happening. doesn't mean that everybody has to be, you know, out trying to rigorously hike every weekend because, you know, maybe it's not for everybody, but yeah. everyone should have at least a little bit of an appreciation of, there's a lot of stuff going out, going on outside your window, whether you live in an urban area or you live in the middle of, you know, the forest. 
there's always a lot of things going on right outside the window. If you just take a look, um, you know, probably any given tree in your yard during summertime, you could probably find 50 to 100 insects hmm. of different species huh, on yeah. the tree. They would be really, really small, and you'd have cool. to look really, really hard. You know, it's just appreciating, you know, the diversity that comes to your light at night when you have, you know, your porch light on and it's dark out. And you have all those, you know, insects flying around. It's really, there's a lot of different things that are there. And if you just kind of take a moment to kind of appreciate that, I think that you, you know, kind of intuit that there's a lot of complexity out there that we don't fully understand. And maybe maybe it's best to be concerned about things we don't understand as opposed to dismissive. Yeah. And as I like to tell people, um, pretty much everyone recognizes that wisdom is important for living well and living a good life. But wisdom doesn't come from looking at our own reflection in the mirror or the human reflection. It comes from knowing the wider world. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what some of this is. You need to know the wider world for um, to know about life and the world we live in and nature because we're part of it. So people yeah. are going to miss out a lot about how to live well and be healthy without knowing some ecology. Yep. Or right. study the insects. Well, maybe they might seem boring, but if you like birds... You like to see the pretty birds. Well, we ain't going to have birds without insects. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. We're not going to have insects without habitat for the insects. So yeah. it's probably not a good idea to, to spray your lawn <laughs> Yeah. to kill all the insects because they're probably not doing that much damage compared to the benefits that they're providing if you like to have birds, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Yeah, and then removing the leaves and stuff, it's like, it occurred to me in studying some of that, um, that you're not merely, I mean, I didn't make up this on my own, you know, I got it from other people, of course, but um, people think of getting rid of gla grass or getting rid of leaves, but we got to think that we're not doing that, we're getting rid of nutrients. All these nutrients were pumped up out of the soil, and... And it's kind of absurd, <laughs> so, you know, people yeah. get rid of the leaves and the grass and then pay yeah. money to, like, put more stuff down when they yeah. had the nutrients right there. Yep, yep. And a lot of times you're you're also removing a lot of the insects that might be your ally. You know, if you, if you break up all the leaves under the tree, you know, you'll notice that a lot of those leaves hmm. have, you know, little gulls on them. Like, yeah. they look like little warts on the leaf. And... And so, sure, when you're getting rid of the leaves, you're getting rid of the little wasps that form those little galls, but then you're also getting rid of all the parasites of that wasp. And so the things that are actually helping defend your tree against these you know, herbivores, you're also getting rid of them as well because you're getting rid of their habitat. In this case, the habitat hmm. would be the dead leaves. Oh, huh. yeah, that's interesting. So that's the reason why it's nice to leave the leaves on the ground because there's a lot of there's actually a lot of living things in a pile of dead leaves that – you know, you don't really see unless you start looking really hard. That's an important thing, too, about studying some of the ecology to learn about habitat. We think about our own habitat, and this is all we need. But if we're going to survive, we need to take care of the things we depend upon, the plants and animals that we eat, for example. And so we need to think, OK, what is their habitat? And yeah, like I hadn't thought of that before, of course, because, you know, you're an ecologist and I'm just me. But <laughs> the thing about removing leaves is removing the habitat that's fascinating that's one thing we can start thinking about all other areas and animals as well what other habitats are there what are, what else are we removing and what about why does it matter to get rid of the wasps aren't wasp all wasp like going to sting us and aren't they all bad and shouldn't we get rid of them yeah right and <laughs> and you know vast majority of wasps are in absolutely totally harmless to people they couldn't sting us if they tried actually most wasps are smaller than a grain of rice hmm. um, you know and they they serve as being either parasites on plants or they're parasites on things that feed on plants so they're actually quite a quite a good thing to have around um, <clears throat> but you know, it's one of those things where most people wouldn't even recognize them as being a wasp hmm. yeah oh, it's, it's just a little fly a little tiny fly or something hmm. How many species are there, like a 1,000 or 3,000 of wasps, or what? Um, oh, in general with wasps, the writ large, probably I would guess a lot more. Huh. Like I would guess in the at least 20,000, wow. if not more than that. Wow. Um, 
You know, there's over 500,000 described species of beetles. Hmm. And there are some people that claim that if you looked hard enough, you would actually find more wasps than beetles. Huh. Well, um, hmm. But again, these are like the movers and shakers that we never, we never see. And I should also point out that wasp is um, kind of a generic term for a bunch of different groups of. They're in the same. They're in the same large grouping of of um, insects. But the things that we commonly call wasps, there's actually a bunch of different families um, hmm. that we call commonly wasps. Um, kind of like bees, right? There's a lot of different things that we call bees. Like bumblebees and honeybees are in different, you know, I guess subfamilies now or however they're however they're putting however they're deciding to put the names on things. But yeah, wasp is a pretty general, pretty general term. That's true for a lot of things, I guess, actually. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like moths or anything that's not a butterfly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, kind of interesting way to, to think about it. But or in terms of the importance of wasps, like I've heard in one book, um some biologists think that we wouldn't exist if wasps weren't around because our ancestors needed plants to live, but if the wasps weren't around to prey on the insects that eat the plants, they would have been much more effective predators and we would have never been able to evolve because the greenery wouldn't have been here to support us. Yeah, or, or you know, I guess if, it's, if it weren't wasps, it might have been something else, but hmm. there's certainly something that needs to occupy that niche. Yeah. Um, especially there's so many, yeah, so like thinking about how many wasps there are, I, I know this, the piece of trivia that there's over, I think, a hundred thousand described species of one particular group of wasps, which are called hmm. ichneumonic wasps. Oh yeah, and and they basically specialize on being parasites on either other insects or directly being parasites on trees. But you know, there's there's lots of them out there, and we just don't really appreciate that there's so many of them out there because they all look like bugs. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of people have studied them, but yeah, I know like Baron Heinrich and his dad um, were very interested in those, that particular type of wasp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. But, um, and then people don't got to be worried about them as much. I mean, sometimes they'll come ask after you, I guess, if you're closer to their nest, but I've been around lots of wasps really close. I don't do anything to them. They don't do anything to me. Um, or I've even been found some hornets nests. Um, yellow jacket nest and I'll get up fairly close and I take a video for like five minutes and I leave them alone. They leave me alone, but I'm ready because I've heard that if one stings you, it leaves, puts out a chemical signal, then the others come after you. So I'm always ready to get the hell out of there if I need to. Yeah. 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 And you have to, and it's always important to remember that like, so yeah, like bald faced hornets, nasty things. They will, they will hurt you. Yellow huh. jackets, they will hurt you, you know, Hmm. paper wasps they will hurt you but there's probably only about i don't know i would guess maybe 10 to 20 species of wasps in north america that'll actually hurt you hmm. um but there's probably well over a hundred thousand species of wasps in north america most of them you wouldn't even recognize as being wasps some of them are really common things you know we were talking about you see the insects flying around your light at night um a lot of those insects that are flying around your light at night are actual, or they're actually wasps. Huh, they're wow. Hmm. And wasps. You can wow. usually, usually if you see an insect that has like a long, like a long straight thing coming out of their tail end, <clears throat> those are probably wasps huh. because that's how they lay their eggs. Interesting. Actually, hmm. the stinger of the wasp that hurt us, um, that's modified egg laying organ. Um, huh. Oh, except wow. Interesting. Such a it's going to, it's going to sting you right for defense, but hmm. most wasps, they're just using their, their stinger basically to lay eggs. So they're terrifying if you're a caterpillar, but <laughs> yeah. they're not so terrifying if you're a person. <laughs> huh? Funny. Yeah. And why are they terrifying if you're a caterpillar? Because they will lay an egg in you. And then <laughs> the, uh, you, you've seen the movie alien, I'm assuming, right? The original mm -hmm. alien where the guy, you know, he starts feeling sick and then the alien pops out of his belly. I'm, I'm convinced that that idea is based upon the life cycle of an ichneumonid wasp. Huh. 
Um, cause I've seen the same thing happen where a caterpillar will be walking along eating and then it will stop eating a little bit. And then all of a sudden it's back will rip open huh, wow. and up crawl this wasp wow, interesting. <laughs> and fly and the wasp will fly away. Wow. And so, yeah, so it, it can be, again, if you're a caterpillar, you should be afraid of wasps, but if you're huh. not a caterpillar, it's okay. <laughs> Then I know we love caterpillars because we love butterflies, but if we have too many, they're going to eat everything. Yeah, yeah, they they, they take care of that. They, they actually, they uh, wasps help take care of that a lot, and uh, and then there's always the weather. You know, hmm. when you, you think about ma what maintains, you know, populations. If if any given female butterfly had more than two offspring survive, if that happened to everybody, then the population of butterflies would skyrocket. Huh. Wow. So obviously a lot of caterpillars are not making it because, you know, if you think even about like a big butterfly, like a swallowtail butterfly, they're probably laying two to four hundred eggs as an adult. And really only two of them have to survive hmm. Interesting. because wow. if more than that survived, then we would be knee deep really quickly in in butterflies. Wow, I didn't know the survival rate was that low. Wow. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's that's the general rule. Like that's actually one of the things that we have figured out in ecology. <laughs> haven't figured out it's so much longer but just kind of the properties of population growth that if you do more than just replace yourself the population is going to start growing really quickly and then you'll exceed your carrying capacity hmm. so we have those huge outbreaks um, of insect swarms like locusts and stuff like that they do a lot of destruction but then ultimately they end up their population crashes because they end up starving to death hmm. yeah and so it's a self-correcting <laughs> self-correcting mechanism what are some other things that people can do um, locally, um, in their own yard, in their backyard, in their general area, besides um, leaving more leaves and maybe not cutting the grass so much? I think planting natives, if you can plant native species, that's always an interesting, good idea. It's just both aesthetically, you know, have, you know, and, and also, you know, have some pride in your, in your local flora and fauna. Um, so I think, you know, planting native plants is nice because then it also will provide potentially habitat and resources for other native, um, insects that, you know, are always looking for resources. And, you know, so much of our flora has been now dominated by invasive species that we always kind of have to work if we care about such things to, to try to plant more, more natives. I think that the most important thing really is to, as much as is possible, um, limit the application of, of pesticides because hmm. even cool. though you think, you know, a lot of like, you know, pest things will be like, ah, oh, do you realize all this stuff is in your grass? And then we can spray these chemicals and we can take <laughs> all the insects in the grass. But a vast majority of arthropods that are in your grass are beneficial to the grass. They're mm -hmm. eating things that actually are damaging the grass. They're also, you know, helping with nutrient cycling and with disturbing the soil, which is going to help the health of your, of your grass or of your garden. And so there's a, there's a temptation to want to just, you know, spray everything, to kill everything. But, um, you know, spraying your lawn isn't really going to keep mosquitoes down because, spoiler alert, mosquitoes breed in water. And so if you don't want <laughs> mosquitoes, maybe clean out your gutters or turn <laughs> over that bucket. But um, I think that the biggest thing that, that people can do just like locally in their backyard is, is to really try to eliminate as much as possible the application of chemical pesticides. Yeah, so there's another important reason to study ecology or to ask ecologists about things. I think a lot of people want the short-term solution or you think you can spray the chemicals and get rid of um, some of the insects, but we need the ecological thinking to think what's further going on. Um, right. Or to kind of be like in some Japanese business programs, I think it is. I think it's from where there they got um, the idea of the seven Ys, you know, W-H-Y, not the letter Y, but instead of thinking, okay, um, you know, so going to deeper levels of explanation, like we got insects and we don't want them. So what are we going to do? Spray them, kill them. Well, ask why. Um, then what is that going to do if you spray them? Like, does do the insecticides and pesticides stay in the person's own yard in that little place or what happens to them? Yeah, and, and yeah, so they don't, right? It's like they go out into the environment, they indiscriminately will will you know knock down anything that they come into contact with and then if you have a lot of uses of those those chemicals eventually 
you'll start having pesticide resistance. I mean, we already hmm. see that oh, in yeah. instance with, you know, with kind of large scale chemical application in, in agriculture. A lot of those chemicals are not really very effective anymore against the important pest species because they've adapted to it. They've evolved resistance to that, that pesticide. Very similar to like what happens, you know, with antibiotics and bacterial resistance and why we're always in this arms race mm, with, yeah, good, good point. with, with mm. that. And so, you know, that's, that's why it's like you should probably not take antibiotics unless you really need them. Because if you do take them without really needing them, all you're doing is providing more opportunities to evolve a superbug. And likewise, probably shouldn't, you know, be putting all of these, these chemicals that you don't necessarily need to have in your, in your yard. I mean, is anybody going to judge you because your your rose bushes have some wilt on the leaf? I doubt. <laughs> yeah. I don't think people really care that much, frankly. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, kind of being aware that these things have what we call a long half-life generally, which is how long it takes for half of it to, to leave the environment. Um, and, you know, when in doubt, you probably don't need to – you probably don't need to spray. Um, I mean, if you have roaches running through your house, I will be sympathetic and say, maybe <laughs> yeah. you do roach bomb in your house. I can be sympathetic to that. But, you know, if you just think there's too many bugs outside, you know, welcome to outside. <laughs> yeah. Think of the consequences. Yeah. I think it was an entomologist. I think it was Borer, uh, a beetle guy. So I know for probably falsely misattribute this really poorly remembered quote from him. But he basically said um, that insects run the world. Hmm. It's about time that we make peace with the landlord. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Which I think is true. Um, most things that are multicellular organisms on the planet are insects. Mm-hmm which is incredible to think about that, you know, more than half of all described life are insects. Um, and pretty much half of all described insects are beetles. So one fourth of all described life is a beetle. Hmm. And then you well, start thinking, well, wow, I bet you have hundreds of beetles in your yard that you don't even notice because they're probably small. They're probably the size of a grain of rice or something like that. But there's a lot of diversity out there and, indiscriminately killing them all is probably not in our best interest. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. one thing studying ecology, people have learned and if we study ecology, more people in our area in Cypress Creek will learn that and apply it. Like people in studying evolution and some stuff, they think about competition, but just like with the sea otter example you gave earlier, a lot in biology is cooperation or beneficial interaction, not competition. Right. Like, yep. get rid of the sea otter, and it's got bad effects on the fish, ultimately. Um, there's a lot of things that we should make peace with, like the insects, and try to cooperate with instead of trying to destroy because we don't understand it or hate it. Um, yep. And at least I have it easy as somebody who advocates for those things, because I study butterflies, and everybody <laughs> likes them. <laughs> yeah. True, uh -huh. yeah. I feel bad for, you know, I have a colleague that studies dung beetles. And it's like, <laughs> they're super important. They're actually way more important than, than huh. we get. Interesting. Wow. But, um, yeah. And so, and yeah, like you said, it's, I think that's why it's a good idea for people to kind of try to challenge themselves with learning a little bit about it. Because I think that if people really appreciated how many things are just living in your yard, it's, it's pretty spectacular, and, you know. You don't need to spray them all away. Yeah. <laughs> not hurting anybody. So I think we both got to go pretty soon. So we'll, of course, continue to wrap up a little bit. But one thing, what are some benefits of the native species? Like why should people plant native species instead of other things? So what are some reasons? Well, um, for, for a lot of things, native species will provide habitat for other native species. And so, you know, you have organisms that have a long history with particular plants, let's say, let's take, you know, let's take butterflies. Um, you know, many butterflies are specialized on a very small group of plants and most of those small groups of plants that they're able to ex exploit in their, in their, you know, native range are native plants. Um, and 
you know, native plants presumably are those plants that are most adept to deal with, you know, local conditions. They, they probably don't require as much energy input to maintaining them. Hmm. You know, if you, if you plant native plants in your yard, you're probably not going to have to keep an eye out for an aphid outbreak or a mealyworm outbreak or a mealybug hmm. outbreak or whatever it might be. Um, and you're probably not going to have to supplement them with fertilizers and, and do all this other stuff because cool. dealing with the plant that it, it has a long history of living in that particular area. So it is kind of part of the local fauna. And it's in some ways you can think about it, it's adapted to it. Um, and then, you know, the other argument for the, uh, for, for thinking about native plants is just that, you know, it, it's, it's kind of nice, I think, to kind of appreciate what, what has always been, or at least in, in a realistic scale, what has always been there, um, as opposed to it just being things that are, you know, highly invasive weeds from some other, from some other area in the world. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a tricky thing, you know, because a lot of people accuse people of being, you know, xenophobic if they're, you know, concerned about invasive species, yeah. but invasive species can, can have these cascading consequences that we might not want. They can, mm -hmm. they can dramatically change the environment because plants are doing a lot of things that we don't really appreciate. You know, they're putting out chemicals underground, they're affecting other plants and, um, and again, if they're a non-native plant, it's probably not going to provide nearly as many food resources mm -hmm. as a native plant would. Um, generally, the things that tend to really hammer um, non-native plants are non-native herbivores. And so we're providing mm -hmm. more resources to, to you know, insects and stuff that are introduced to an area as opposed to being um, kind of part of the native, the native flora and fauna. Interesting. Yeah, and then what with... Uh... They're adapted to the climate, so you don't have to water them as much. They'll get the water they need from local climate. Um, as you say, you don't got to fertilize them as much and or at all, and so you save money on that. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Yep. Um, and then if some people go get outdoors around here, um, go for a walk and everything, observe people would actually find that there are actually some beautiful flowers out here, like the uh, prairie nymph. Um, we got um, the, uh, what's it called, um, passion vine. We got purple passion vine native out here, yellow passion vine. I've never seen the yellow in bloom yet, but I, I know I've seen the, the vine. Um, you know, if you want a beautiful flower, like plant those in your backyard. And you get really wonderful caterpillars and butterflies as a consequence. Oh, that's, yeah. the, that's the only host plant that the Gulf fertility will feed on. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. That's you know, I have, in my yard, I have a very, I have an area about the size of my office, which doesn't do anybody any good because all you can do is scare me, but it's probably about <laughs> a 15 or 20 feet by 15 or 20 feet area in my backyard of nothing but passiflora, which hmm. grew as basically a weed in my backyard, and I just hmm. started mowing around it. And then I'm like, oh, look at that. So I got a huge patch of it. And I had, nice. you know, I had probably 500 caterpillars on it. Wow. Of course, they're all dead now because it was super cold two nights ago and they do not like the cold. But for a while, I had a lot of butterflies in the yard and a lot of caterpillars. And that was kind of fun. And it's pretty easy to do. Cool. And people noticed it in the neighborhood. They're like, yeah, have you noticed <laughs> yeah. More butterflies here? I've never seen this many. Wow. And I'm like, yeah, that's because my backyard is one big giant pass of <laughs> Nice. So. But Yep. And then for folks, the Gulf Riddle area is what kind of like a mimic of the monarch. If that might be a good description for him, but um, yeah, they're, they're they're orange. They're bright orange with silvery spots on the on the on the bottom of the wing. They're beautiful. They're, they're a handsome animal. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. Very handsome. Well, cool. I'd like to continue, but yeah, we both uh, got some stuff coming up. We better go. But um, yep. so hopefully, we learned a lot about ecology and the importance of ecological function and ecological thinking. Um, any last words, Jim? Um, well, first, thanks for having me on. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there's one thing. I, I made I made an error when I was talking 45 minutes ago that I realized <laughs> I can't fix it now. I'm fully aware that there are no caribou in, in Yellowstone. I meant elk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even catch that. Wow. Yeah, cool. cool. It's my editor inside of me. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
But yeah, well, no, thanks a bunch. And cool. it, was, it was great talking with you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Have a yep. good day. Talk to you, you later. Too. Thanks. Bye.